Japan's meteorological agency says there were more than 2,300 noticeable earthquakes in Japan this year. That's lower than last year's tally, but still higher than the annual average before the March 2011 quake. Agency officials say they categorized 2,366 tremors as noticeable earthquakes by December 29th this year. That's down from over 3,000 last year and from more than 10,000 in 2011. In April, a magnitude 6.3 quake shook Awaji Island in Hyogo Prefecture. That was for the first time in two years that they observed an intensity of 6 minus on the Japanese seismic scale of 0 to 7. And in October, a magnitude 7.1 quake off Fukushima Prefecture prompted officials to issue a tsunami advisory. Meteorological agency officials say the March 2011 earthquake is still producing aftershocks. They're urging people to be prepared for a major quake. The Japanese quake. power company wants to restart a nuclear reactor damaged by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Tohoku Electric has applied for a government safety screening of the reactor at its Onagawa plant in northeastern Japan. A fire broke out at the plant when the quake hit. The tsunami damaged some of the plant's emergency generators. The utility is building seawalls 29 meters high to protect the plant from future tsunamis. It also plans to install a filtered vent by March 2016. Plant officials would use the vent in an emergency to release pressure in a reactor containment vessel. The vent would also limit radioactive emissions. We want to prove that our safety measures meet the new standards set by the Nuclear Regulation Authority. Actually, we're doing more than that. We want local people to know that. We want to dispel their anxiety about the safety of the plant. Utilities have submitted safety screening applications for eight other plants since July. Those plants were not damaged by the quake and tsunami. All reactors in Japan are now Engineers at Japan's crippled nuclear plant think they know how hundreds of tons of radioactive water leaked into the ground. They say plastic filler in barriers around tanks on the Fukushima Daiichi site probably deteriorated. Workers from Tokyo Electric Power Company noticed on Tuesday that water had leaked past two concrete barriers. They say 225 tons got out. The water inside the barriers contained radioactive strontium at 44 times the concentration the government says is safe. The workers drained out that water and found the concrete free of cracks. They covered the joints with new plastic filler, then no water got out. The workers concluded the leaks had happened because the filler had deteriorated. Company representatives say they'll apply new filler to all the other barriers at the plant and step up their inspections. Japan is breaking its own radioactive records as huge amounts of beta ray emitting substances have been discovered at another reactor at the crippled Fukushima power plant. Meanwhile, the government says the decontamination work scheduled to be completed by March may take another three years. And for more, we're now joined live by Alex Kerr, an expert on Japan. Uh, Mr. Kerr, welcome to RT. Very nice to see you. Uh, so we've had numerous reports. Uh, uh, about uh, uh, leaks there in uh, Fukushima Daiichi and uh, now we're hearing about a fresh one. Uh, from your point of view, why they're not able to cope with all that? Well, this is one in a long series. It's an ongoing story. And uh, the, the real problem is that the government has spent so much energy in uh, hiding the information 
uh, that at this point, I, can, I think it's fair to say that nobody knows what's really going on. Mm. Uh, we know that Japan won uh, Olympic Games, uh, but uh, there are so many activists in the world who have some sort of health concerns about it. Do you think that their worries are, are justified? I don't think their worries are justified in the sense that it's going to impact Tokyo. So I think that people could come freely to the Games and not worry about it. But uh, that area of Japan, Fukushima Prefecture and the areas around it, are going to be seriously affected for decades, or maybe a century. Uh, parts of it will be uh, pretty much permanently unlivable. Not to mention the fears that we have of the radioactivity that's flowing into the ocean. And uh, we, no one can imagine what the long-term effects uh, are going to be on a sea life uh, and many other things. Uh, there have been media reports that the containment tanks that have been leaking there were built by uh, uh, inexperienced uh, employees who uh, basically uh, were rushing to uh, build them. Uh, does that suggest that there are lots more secrets we don't know about? Well, of course, because the entire uh, system of management of TEPCO, in fact, of the entire nuclear industry of Japan, has been to rely on unskilled, uneducated, and unspecialist daily workers, uh, guys they pick up off the street and are brought in and paid a daily wage. Who wouldn't have a, some of them don't even realize they're going into a radioactive circumstance. Uh, it's not professional. It's, it's a comedy of errors. And uh, the, the, the tanks are just one of many, many uh, structures that were built hurriedly without expertise, without consulting international specialists. It's fair to say that it's a big mess and it will get worse. Experts say Japan is obviously failing to safely clean up the plant and needs help from outside. Do you agree? I do agree. I think it's very, very difficult for Japan to do that uh, for reasons of national pride and also because as soon as you bring in the outsiders, it upsets this thing that they call the nuclear village. Uh, that's a term we use in Japan for the scientists, the academics, the bureaucrats, the politicians, and the uh, contractors and the operators. These cozy, interrelated situations where anyone who comes in from outside and demands a certain amount of openness and professionalism will upset that nice situation. So it's very difficult to actually bring them in and make use of them. Alex Kerr, expert on Japan. Uh, Mr. Kerr, thank you very much indeed for that. This is RT International. Japan's seafood industry says it's blighted by contaminated catches. Nearly three years after the Fukushima nuclear disaster polluted surrounding land and waterways. They can't convince customers their fish is safe, even though the authorities insist they're doing their level best to show they've got a grip on the problem. Alex Arashevsky now reports. Work doesn't stop in the port of Soma. Despite being just a few kilometers from areas still ravaged by the 2011 tsunami and still contaminated by radiation. Seafood of all shapes and sizes lands here several times a day. Not only fish has traditionally been the integral part of the Japanese food culture, but also one of its prized exports. Last year alone, the exporting companies pocketed more than 2 billion US dollars. However, there are serious concerns now. This particular catch was made in the waters of the Fukushima nuclear power station. After it became known that hydraulic system at the Fukushima nuclear power plant was severely radiated, fears grew that the contamination could be spreading into the Pacific. There are a significant contamination in the bottom sediment, especially in the pond and the river system, that we can find a very, very high concentration of the radio system is accumulated. Fish factories around the Fukushima prefecture now have to take radiation measurements. But despite lab workers assuring us the fish was free of any harmful particles, we're taking samples from every catch we make, and if we ever find even slightest trace of radiation, we'll destroy the whole catch. So far there has been none. This fish is safe. And even the nuclear plant operator TEPCO standing firm that the nearby waters are clear of radiation. The situation is pretty much under control. We've built fences not to let polluted groundwaters leak into the ocean. We were surprised to learn that most of the seafood we saw at the port of Soma will never make it to the shelves of fish markets or restaurant tables.
Most of the fish caught within the 30 kilometer radius is thrown into the garbage because it is radiated and TEPCO is paying local fishermen for it. So they're happy and keep silent. Some of it though makes it to stores, but only locally. Seafood firms here are under threat and there are five prefectures possibly affected by contamination in the sea, accounting for almost 40,000 tons of fish per year. But things may get even worse as the third anniversary of the Fukushima disaster approaches. South Korea has become the first country to ban Japanese fish and seafood imports. Alexei Roshevsky, RT. Battle against childhood cancer is far from won. However, with advances in medical technology, survival rates have improved. About 80% of children in the developed world who get cancer can now expect to beat it. But the treatments have a downside that can cause serious health problems further down the line. NHK World's Kazaki Hirama reports. Hoto Tanaka is a second-year high school student living in Tokyo. At the age of 11, he was diagnosed with leukemia, a form of cancer. He underwent treatment that included anti-cancer drugs for a year and a half and was told he had overcome the disease four years ago. I fought hard to beat leukemia. I wanted to tell everyone I was healthy again. On leaving hospital, he looked forward to a normal life. Then several months later, he had the feeling something was wrong. He had numbness and sudden weakness in his left hand. A few months later, while walking up the stairs at a train station, he lost all strength in his lower body. He fell and broke his leg and had to use a wheelchair. It's scary where there is no handrail. I can't go up or down stairs anymore. What caused all of this? Tanaka went back to the specialist who had treated him for leukemia. The numbness grows stronger, then weakens. It repeats over and over. The doctor diagnosed him with late effects of his cancer treatment. The condition occurs when children who are still growing are given anti-cancer drugs and radiation treatments. They include abnormalities in the body systems, including muscles and the thyroid. Of all survivors of childhood cancer, some 60 to 70 percent are said to suffer delayed side effects. Doctors in Western countries observe guidelines to coordinate treatment of late effects. But Japan lacks such a framework. In many cases, when treatment is spread across different specialists, doctors don't share information on their patients. When it comes to treatment, these conditions are beyond the scope of what the doctor can handle. So the doctor has no choice but to send the patient to different specialists in each area. Tanaka doesn't know what precautions he should take in daily life. This lack of information makes him worry. If the numbness in my hands and legs doesn't get any better, I guess it will always be there. Japanese doctors are aware of the problems in their system. Recently, a group of childhood cancer specialists launched a system to quickly identify delayed side effects and set a course of treatment. They drew upon Western guidelines to create the new framework. Professor Miho Maeda of Nippon Medical School is a core member of the group. She helped write a set of rules that's easy for patients to understand. There are five levels, depending on the type of treatment the patient received. For only light drugs and surgery, an annual health check is recommended. For heavier medications and radiation treatment on the brain, for example, a yearly specialist examination is advised. If a patient presents with late effects, the guidelines call for mandatory detail tests at least once every six months. Our first challenge now is to have doctors who treat childhood cancer to understand these guidelines and to disseminate this information to their peers. The doctors continue to collect patient data and work on more effective diagnosis and treatments. 
they hope one day to be able to say surviving cancer really does mean the chance to live a healthy life. Kazuaki Hirama, NHK World.